panel discussion hosted by Architects Without Borders Seattle. So you might be wondering um, who is Architects Without Borders? Uh, we're a nonprofit organization uh, about 10 years old and our work connects local architects, landscape architects, engineers and other design professionals with communities in need around the world and here locally that would otherwise not be able to access design services. As an organization invested in equity and design, we believe that providing access to our volunteer design services helps underserved communities develop the tools they need to improve their lives. If you're interested in learning more about Architects Without Borders, please pick up a flyer, visit our website, which is right up there, uh, sign up for the volunteer mailing list, or and attend an upcoming event, which I will talk about briefly at the very end for those who are interested. Um, I'll also be available after the session. Uh, if you'd like to talk to me, and I know I see some other board members here who will also be hanging around and available. Today we're honored to have a great set of people to participate in and moderate our panel discussion. I would like to first introduce you to our moderator, Maria Rodriguez. Maria is a doctoral candidate at the University of Washington School of Social Work. Maria's research interests intersect demography, data science, public policy, and social welfare. Her research uses large administrative and text-based data to investigate the policy development process within the federal housing policy subsystem. Maria's work is centered on understanding the impacts of contemporary housing policy on urban dwelling, low-income communities of color. The goal of her work is to identify and examine viable strategies for securing home ownership as a road to wealth creation for low-income households. So thank you for joining us, Maria. And Maria is going to introduce our esteemed panelists. Also, an associate professor in the University of Washington School of 
that the mental work focuses on basic attachment, basic identity, and social justice as a device of the global housing and their new generation. In this book, basic attachment advances the very capitalism research of Patrick Cartwright was published by others in 2004. So without further ado, it is the world of the world. Okay. Are we with we'll this? No? How about that? And one more time. Are we actually on? Yes. Yeah, actually. Sorry, guys. Give us a minute. Okay. No. <laughs> All right, while we're uh, while we're getting started here, so um, uh, I am here today uh, because uh, uh, Erin Feeney, the AWB co-president, uh, sits sits next to me at our office, and she made me come. So uh, if you if you find what I have to say fascinating, you can credit me. If you find it to be incredibly dull, you can go talk to Erin. <laughs> um, so the question of the day is. Why has our housing become so expensive? And um, I had the pr privilege of serving on the HALA committee um, and uh, spending almost a year kind of thinking about these questions. And during that time, we got to crunch a lot of numbers, see a lot of data, a lot of studies, uh, a lot of slideshows. And every so often, a little factoid would come along uh, and combine with another one, and you have a little aha moment. And I wanted to share some of those aha moments that I had with you. So uh, without further ado, um, Seattle has been growing pretty steadily um, throughout uh, its history from the inception up to the 1960s. Pretty steady growth curve. There's a little bump in there for a minor event called the Great Depression, but otherwise a pretty steep curve. 1960s, there's a change. And um, between the growth, basically the growth of suburbanization and the Boeing bust and white flight and all the social turmoil that came with that, uh, the city emptied out. We lost over 10% of our population. And uh, since around the 80s, it began to turn around. The city began to grow again. And, you know, it's been a pretty steady upward trend since then. So uh, 2010, through, through that decade, it was just a steady growth. And we've seen actually really major acceleration come in the last few years. Um, we're growing fast. I think we know we're all growing fast. Um, the, the aha insight I had into this was that the period in which I grew up, where my parents bought their house and where I bought my house, was we think of that as, as normal times. And we think of what's, what we're going through today as an anomaly. And what we see, if you kind of look at the, at the population curve, is when I bought my house and when my parents bought they, their house, it was a city that was partly emptied out. So yeah, our housing was pretty cheap because, because there was a surplus of it. And we've, we've now absorbed that surplus. We kind of we, we recovered all of our population by the turn of the century. And now we're, all of our growth has to come, all of our population growth has to be matched by housing growth. And so what we're going through now is closer to normal than, than what we think of as being normal. The, the past was an anomaly, an historical anomaly of 40 years. But what we should expect going forward is that we can't go back to what we have. Um, the uh, household trends, we used to have much bigger households back in the 60s. We had an average household size of about 2.7. It's dropped to about two today. And uh, again, a little insight I had into that, which is that if you think about our average household size as two, well, if we add 10,000 people to the city, we need 5,000 units. But the math doesn't work like that because the number keeps on dropping because the folks that are joining the city are smaller households. So if you kind of look at those numbers and you do the math, what you'll find is that the average household that's, create, that's moving into the city is about 1.6 persons. So you don't need 5,000 units to meet 10,000 people, you need about 6,300. So the numbers are a little counterintuitive based on the, the, the data that most of us know. Um, the region's growing. The region's growing, has been growing steadily. Um, and if you kind of look very carefully at the curves, you can see that 
the region, the regional growth is going through the same uptick that we're going through in the city. Um, and the insight here, if you look at the numbers, is that yes, we're growing and we're growing faster. But what's really happening is that as people move to the to the county to the area, they're starting to choose cities at twice the rate that they used to. So we used to city used to absorb twenty percent of regional growth. All of a sudden, it's absorbing forty percent of regional growth, and that's really a generational shift. That's a cultural shift that we're going through. And it's not just us. If you, you know, head off to go see Google public data, you'll, you'll see growth curves like that in all of the cities that are like us. The sort of the, if you look at kind of Western cities of about our size that have similar economies and similar, similar job bases, you're going to see that pattern. Um, and that's a generational trend, just like suburbanization was back in, back in from the sixties to the eighties. This is what this urbanization is what we're seeing today. It's how people want to live and what they're going to choose. Um, we're building lots of housing. Don't get me wrong. We're, we're, we're growing fast and we're building lots. We used to, two decades ago, we used to build 2,400 units a year. Now we are building, sorry, last decade, we built about 4,500 units a year. And in the last, um, in the last couple of years, we've gotten it up to a net increase of about 7,500 units per year. So we're responding to the demand. Um, but if you look at all of those numbers together, what you see, if you compare the population growth with the unit, with the unit growth, and then you factor in the household size, you can kind of see in the red numbers that we're mostly falling behind. And in the last few years, we're really falling behind. So every year we're, we're missing the number by, you know, sometimes 5,000, sometimes 2,000. In the last four years, we've, we've, we've fallen behind demand by 17,000 housing units. And so it, it shouldn't surprise you if you kind of compare, this is a very distorted Dupre and Scott uh, chart of, of rent change. And the graphic isn't very clear, but the little dots along the middle, that's a 0% change in, in rent growth. And so if you kind of look historically at the, at, the, at the periods where we've fallen behind on production, that's where you see big changes in, in, in rent growth. So that is why when you see the hollow, rec the hollow recommendations that, that Sarah is going to talk about, there's a lot of emphasis on more housing. And the, the reason is pretty simple, which is that if you, if you can't solve the supply and demand problem, it becomes very, very hard to solve any of the other problems because the scarcity creates rent escalation and bidding wars. And it basically, it, it, reduces the effectiveness of all the other things that you might do. And there are other things that we have to do. So um, supply and demand and, and the needs of the housing market is not the only part of the equation. There are um, the, the private housing market can meet the demands of a lot of people, but below a certain threshold, it's not going to be an effective way to deliver housing for people below a certain threshold of income. And uh, part, of, part of the story um, of, of our local economy and our national economy and our and the global economy is one of rising income inequality, where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And what that means is that for folks that cannot be served by, by the private housing market, we need more resources in order to go into subsidized housing or just subsidies in general. Um, and I think, again, we'll talk more about those as well. So, and then, uh, Last, last deep thought is on the construction industry itself. Um, I think we're, we all, anyone who works in the industry knows that construction is really expensive right now. Um, and the construction prices are very volatile. They rise and fall very quickly uh, based on demand. And, um, but if you kind of factor out, this is kind of the kind of, you know, big, big, uh, big uh, oscillations in construction price based on just, you know, uh, the immediate conditions. What you see over a 50 year trend is that um, productivity in the general economy has been growing pretty steadily, but that's the top green line. The bottom line is productivity in the construction industry and the different lines are just basically different deflators trying to compare it to consumer price index or housing price index or a bunch of other things. And what you're finding is that productivity in the construction industry is not keeping up. Um, and so the construction industry has the same problem as, say, a symphony orchestra, which is that if you can't figure out how to play Mozart with faster or with fewer people, then you can't keep up with productivity in the rest of the economy. And the only way to keep the symphony open is that it has to become more expensive to go see the show. And that's what's happened. And that's what's happened 
in the construction industry and for housing in general. So just to quickly sum up, um, you know, at, at, the, at the simplest level, the solutions are gonna be around more housing. We have to find a way to respond to the, the demand in the marketplace. And whatever the demand is, we have to find a way to build that amount of housing. Um, the, the power recommendations that are coming out have set a goal for 50,000 units of, of housing over the next 10 years, that's great. But if we have demand for 100,000, we have to build those 100,000. Um, more resources, we have to find a way to, to get more money to people who are disadvantaged in our current economic system and who the private market cannot help. And then finally, if we can't do those two things, then we need our friends at Amazon and Google and Facebook to build us a robot army so we can build our houses on cheaper. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so <clears throat> I'm, I, I don't want to make uh, too many assumptions here. I just want to make sure that we all know what we mean when we talk about affordability. Do you know what affordability is? Okay, well, I'll give you a definition that is a federal definition that's used by most agencies, and that is that in order to be affordable, housing costs, including utilities, should be no more than 30% of your income. That means if you make $10,000 a month, you supposedly can afford $3,000 for your housing. And if you make, say, $2,500 a month, which is $15 an hour at full time, and you can afford maybe $750 a month. I'm letting that sink in for just a minute. Does anybody here ever rent a place for $750 a month? Or have you seen a place in Seattle that rents for $750? Well, um, you know, we could uh, look at other models of affordability, but that is the one that's best for now. And um, I think I can probably guess that everybody in this room knows someone who is affected by the affordability crisis that we face. And I know David just talked to us a lot about what the reasons for that affordability crisis is. The fact is that um, Seattle is alone, I know David said that as well, any large city in the U.S. that has any kind of limits on its growth uh, from a big management boundary, uh, or has a very strong economy, strong employment, strong population growth, faces similar crises. And this has a number of impacts that go way beyond whether it takes me a long time to get to work, but a lot of them are about how long it takes to get to work and how people do get to work. So that's why it's so important that we really deal with these issues today. And this is a regional challenge. Because what David and, and what I will talk about today really was, is more about Seattle and the in Seattle. But the fact is that a lot of people who are not in Seattle but are still in Seattle can't afford to live here, so they live somewhere else. So this is actually a big issue. But I will talk really today a lot just on Seattle. Um, so I do want to reiterate that the cost of buying property and building or buying uh, property and rehabbing existing is high. And the market actually determines what the rents are. So in a market economy like the one that we live in, I think most experts, including people from the Brookings Institution like Robert Fuentes and uh, Bruce Cass, agree that the only way to provide affordability reliably in those markets is through um, regulatory incentives and regulatory requirements. Now, um, Edinburgh recognized this last year and created a housing affordability and livability agenda for Seattle. And he, um, he had a goal to create more housing to accommodate the growing population and to make sure that those housing units would include affordability for a variety of incomes, not just those fortunate enough to earn six figure salaries in our city. And so then we appointed a 28 member advisory committee, which David was a part of. And I will say that I was very pleased to be out on that, although it took many months and a lot of hard work. Um, he drew from um, 
broad variety of interest groups, uh, for profit, non profit, um, and then they charged the committee the task of creating a plan that can generate a net increase of 50,000 housing units. And that includes 20,000 that would be affordable to working people and people who are less fortunate than those of us that um, are able to work. So the Housing Affordability and Livability Advisory Committee, HALA Committee, came up with a report that included 65 recommendations. Let's see, what am I doing here? Am I doing that? There we go. That's the report. You can see that they came out in July, they were supposed to come out in May. That kind of tells you how hard that work was. And um, you can see the entire report in the City of Seattle's website. So in the next few minutes, I'm just going to summarize what the 65 recommendations were, the most impactful of those recommendations. And um, they fall into four categories, four general categories. I highly recommend reading it. I know it seems a little wonky, but um, it's quite a readable report, and it's uh, it's it's good. Good stuff in it because it does talk about how can we create more resources. And more resources means more money, more money to subsidize building and uh, immigrants themselves. And how can we uh, put in place measures that will allow more housing to be built? And then more supports for the communities. That's, um, that's going to be about avoiding displacement and preserving what we have. And then more innovation is about streamlining the systems and other reforms that we need to make it easier for us to build and maintain us. So more resources, some of the measures uh, include the commercial industry, and the mandatory engineering housing regulations that the mayor and the council of Hawaii have already introduced as legislation to city council. Then also includes renewing and increasing the Seattle housing levy. This would be the uh, sixth renewal, seventh renewal, sixth renewal of the housing levy uh, that started in 1981. And um, the committee recommends at least doubling its size probably more than the limit size for the most recent housing levy of 145 million, so this would be more like 300 million plus. Um, renewing and expanding the multifamily tax exemption, which is um, a property tax exemption that applies to uh, projects that agree to maintain a certain number of uh, apartments or condo units as affordable over a period of 12 years. Um, they uh, recommend reinstating the Seattle Growth Fund, which uh, bonds against a certain amount of property tax increases that happen when you build more property. You have greater property tax in that. Growth in property tax can be bonded against increased resources. Um, we used to have one of the it was, uh, it was uh, kind of went to sleep during uh, a couple of recessions ago, I'm going to put it that way. Um, we want more funding for the housing trust fund at the state level, and that requires obviously looking at the state level. So the city of Seattle can't do that alone. Um, and also establishing a real estate excise tax that is specifically aimed at creating affordable housing. Um, and that also requires a state action. Now, the more housing category includes uh, more density. So, allowing more density. Um, Kind of expanding some of the boundaries of urban growth villages, allowing more height, more floor area ratio in, uh, in some of those areas. Also, uh, modification of building code to allow more flexibility in building wood frame for higher density projects. Um, making it a priority to use public surplus lands for affordable housing and thus reducing the cost. And then also boosting the production of accessory both attached and detached. Uh, the support for communities includes measures like um, expanding the multifamily tax exemption, which I just described to you. Right now, it only applies to new construction. If we expand it to also apply to existing buildings that are naturally affordable, in exchange for landlords agreeing to maintain the properties in good condition but with lower rents, 
to save money on property taxes, that can help preserve some of the natural affordability that, I think, that uh, exists in our communities. Um, there's also more and more intensive education about the best way to relate to one another in our communities, and also finding resources for more subsidies so that low income households can actually afford rent in the market. And the innovation includes something that many of us in the community, and probably many of you in this room, have been talking about for a lot of years, and it's making the permit process more efficient. Um, and, and possibly changing the limits of projects that we need to have seen early. And so that will, um, that will contract the amount of time spent permitting and efforts to permitting, and will hopefully lower costs and make it possible to um, build new housing even more quickly. So, as I said before, uh, proposed legislation has already been introduced that would enact the two major components that I mentioned first, which are the uh, commercial linkage fee, which basically is a fee that developers will pay for new commercial lines based on the area of those lines. They'll pay them into a fund, and that money becomes available to developers uh, for affordable housing. And will be primarily um, nonprofits and uh, housing authorities, depending on what the situation is uh, once those regulations are enacted. And then the um, mandatory inclusionary housing provision says that new multifamily structures must include a certain percentage of their uh, units, of their quarter acre units, as affordable for people at certain levels, depending on the design uh, again of that program. And uh, there is an option, I think, or there will be proposed an option to be able to buy one's way out of that, but it's going to probably be a way that will um, encourage the actual development of those will create um, those will create opportunities for people to choose to live affordably throughout the city. This will apply throughout the city where multifamily is allowed, and so people will have choices now to live where they have access to opportunities, access to work, access to transit, and schools, and other necessities of our neighborhoods. Now, how is that going to really affect the lives? Because that was the beginning of this discussion was we're developing for equity and we're designing for equity. Well, when people have choices about where to live, what impact does that really have on their lives? And to tell you a little bit about the research in this area, I'm going to hand this over to Graham and Liz going to talk about what she found about what happens if people can choose to live in, uh, in, a, in an area. That has a lot of access to Lynn? So, will it be clear how to advance this? Oh, yeah. I missed it before. That's the marriage action plan. Oh. And if you want to write uh, <laughs> to the I trail. Just give me 30 seconds to write down. Yeah, so if you want to write that down. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for choosing to spend part of your Saturday um, here. And hopefully you're finding it worthwhile. Can you hear me well enough if I step away? No? Okay. All right. Usually, I'm told in the last year, but being here for 15 years is not changing that. All right, so good afternoon. Thank you all for being here, is what I was saying, um, and choosing to spend your Saturday here. Appreciate that. And if you'll honor you to be part of this panel and have the opportunity to share some of my ideas with you today. Um, so, uh, as we all know, uh, Seattle's growing exponentially. And that, along with the proliferation of what I call and others call urban regeneration programs, has dramatically altered the landscape of our city. But how then, in the face of this change, can we retain affordability and, very importantly, uh, avoid the displacement of poor people? So you've heard a little bit about Paula and that committee and the very important work that they're doing and going forward. My point of departure um, in talking to you today is looking a little bit back at the past 14 years 
of uh, public housing redevelopment that has happened in the city of Seattle and the region, and the displacement that it has uh, caused. Uh, now, I'm approaching this as an environmental psychologist, uh, and I want to talk to you a little bit about what the research I've been doing is found in this area. Um, environmental psychology basically is an interdisciplinary social science, and its focus is on looking at the impact of the physical environment on the quality of people's lives. So, as someone who's really interested, as the introduction mentioned, in place attachments, place meaning, the lived experience of place, um, and very interested in housing and social justice, I became intrigued by these public housing redevelopment programs like Hoop 6, um, you imagine a lot of you may have heard of that, housing opportunities for people everywhere, especially with the public stands for. Um, and that's been going on for a number of years. It's actually a 20 year old program that started in 1993. So places here in Seattle like High Point, Rainier Vista, New Holly, those are all six sites, Green Ridge and White Center, all of those six sites. Um, so I wanted to so use the arrows. Okay, so just some examples of what the housing looks like and its demolition. Now, the, these redevelopment programs actually require the demolition. These are going on national. This is the national program run by them. So this has been happening on the national level. And it involves the demolition of the original public housing and its replacement by new mixed income communities. And when Virginia and Architect Sal Borders asked me to be on this panel, she asked me to talk about those impacts of mixed income because the whole premise is to deconcentrate poverty and to demolish that public housing and replace it with new mixed income communities. So this is what I think is the impacts of, along with a cohort of other researchers across the country who've been trying to understand if this is really hitting the desired goals. Uh, that it's supposed to, that mixed income is supposed to. So just a quick before and after photo of the same street corner. So these projects can be very sexy, right? It's new housing, there's capital funding, sort of capital improvement funds for housing authorities to rebuild distressed housing. They're doubling in density, but what we've seen nationwide as well as in this area is that there is a net loss of affordable housing units on the site. So this is the context in which I've been doing this research, being interested in, again, place attachments, place meaning. And that's not Seattle on the right, that's actually Germany, and it's an Argentinian artist's argument about displacement, because these kinds of programs are happening on a global level as well. So when I started this research with my colleague Rachel Cleet, who's now at Ohio State, um, we didn't know what we were going to find. Um, and so we, we were very curious about what we would see. And time and again, when we spoke to residents, and we worked with three different housing authorities in this area, talked to and surveyed hundreds of public housing residents, and time again, we heard stories of these places as stabling, stabilizing forces in people's lives. Um, these were places that were home. And what's important about this, I think, was that we saw this enormous, we, we didn't expect this, we didn't know again what to expect. And we saw this enormous amount of mutual support networking, for example, that would have been the envy of any middle class neighborhood trying to put a block party together. So this is clearly home, and they were socially thriving places. And it stood in sharp contrast to the rhetoric created by policymakers and media about these places as distressed and worthy of demolition. So we were curious about what these impacts would be um, on people. I'll get to this in a minute. Um, so if you look at this layer of absorbedness, because this is lots of assumptions and I'm heading in that direction. But what I want to say very briefly, I want to make sure there's time for discussion. We can talk about this later if you're interested. But looking at the results of this redevelopment, right? Because it's demolition, so people are displaced. They have to move elsewhere. And the idea is, are people doing that? And are people who are being moved into middle class neighbors, presumably, and that's actually not happening? Um, are they doing better? And what's happening on the sites post redevelopment? And are they doing better with the mixing? And across the board, not just our research, but nationally, 
No. Okay. Now the results are very mixed. Okay. And it's complicated. And I don't have. And you, it's certainly something you can absorb, but I just don't have time. So uh, suffice it to say, there's plenty of empirical evidence to show that this is not automatically improving the lives of low-income families. That they are not tapping in mixed-income communities more into social capital, which was presumed to happen. Um, so basically, there's plenty of evidence so that the immediate public housing residents are not benefiting. So again, it's nationwide. And actually, in some extreme cases, in some cities like Chicago, there are class and cultural conflicts that emerge in the use of the common spaces as well. So going forward in thinking about new growth and development, it's crucial to examine the implicit assumptions. Virginia had asked me to speak a little bit about this as well, because if you really unpack this and you look at this idea of the strategy of mixed income, it's really important to look at what the implicit assumptions are behind these kinds of policies. So this is the final report of the National Commission on Severely Distressed Public Housing. Um, and I think it speaks volumes, which it says a thousand words, it speaks volumes to what presumably the life in the environment of poor people looks like. And this woman is looking out the window towards her future, where she's in a mixed income housing and she's, old, she's got a job, her kids in school, and life is good and it's one of those. So there's lots of assumptions that, you know, went into the launching of this program as well. So the first assumption uh, is social isolation that poor people living in proximity um, to one another creates problematic social isolation. And to counter this, mixed income strategies are based on this belief uh, that comes from sociology and psychology of the exposure effects. Uh, and here it's the idea that through observation, through just proximity and social interaction, economic and diverse neighbors, uh, that poor residents can then observe these behaviors, learn different values, and somehow access, you know, jobs, okay? So, um, so that's a really interesting thing. I suppose that's supposed to happen by osmosis. I'm sorry, I'm a little sarcastic about this, but again, there is not a preponderance of empirical research evidence to demonstrate this, because we know it takes more than knowing a neighbor with a job to be able to get a job or to get access to education and job skills and so on. So, you know that uh, idea. But this idea is what, that's really important too is that mixed income was done in ways, you know, I, I'm not saying mixed income is evil, but people are advocating for it are misguided necessarily. It also depends on how you're achieving mixed income. And the demolition of low income housing wholesale is not the answer. So just want to be clear that while I am skeptical about some of the benefits of mixing income, what I'm trying to do is unpack some of the assumptions so that we can go forward with these strategies in a way that doesn't cause displacement and is not based on stigmatized understandings and misunderstandings of poverty and poor people, right? So the, and I would say the argument is also, well, mixed income because it's not right to, to segregate low-income people, right? And moreover, there's the whole reality of class as well, I'm sorry, of race as well as class, right? Those two things are very interconnected. So this idea of segregation is very important, but I would argue that it's not just income segregation that's important, it's the segregation of people from decision-making power and from the right to make choices. So that's an issue. Uh, I, I gotta move on. Um, okay, so that's the idea of social isolation. Um, and I think it's built based on self congratulatory notions of the middle class that just, you know, if you live around us, you'll be like us and like us. Okay. All right, the second assumption is the social pathology of the poor, the strategy to mix incomes and disperse concentrations of poverty is actually predicated on old notions of the social pathology of the poor, which is evident in uh, sort of medical metaphors that are used, the phrase contagion effect has actually been used uh, in some of the early discourse. You look at this historically. Uh, to, and that's the use to express concern about social problems that come from concentrated poverty. The argument I would make there is that this is an individual level explanation that ignores structural racism and uh, other political economic factors, and it has more of a blame the victim uh, kind of uh, argument behind it. 
it's like they can't tell from my screen where we are with my animations. So, uh, so there. Uh, and then the third, oops, no, I went through it's too fast, huh? Okay, the third assumption you, you have already read is uh, the distinction between uh, the des what's called the deserving and the undeserving poor. Um, this is a long time strategy. These are not my words. This has been in the discourse for centuries, actually, in the US. Uh, that, and it, there's a wonderful uh, scholar, Larry Vale from MIT, who's looked at uh, the history of public housing in the US, fascinating work. And he's talked about how America has a deeply uh, rooted societal ambivalence towards poverty and poor people. Uh, and that this is based on an ideology of independence and home ownership. But ironically, that's quite mythical, right? Because if you own a home, you are not independent at all. You are tied to substantial debt. And the bigger the house, the bigger the subsidy uh, that you're actually getting. Uh, and public housing is seen as a, as a challenge to that. So now what I'm talking about this and it's like, well, this is design equity. So what about design? And that's a really important issue. I guess in conclusion, one of the things I would say is that the, some of these current public housing redevelopment projects are framed in a way that devalues poor communities. But these uh, communities have relationships that have created a sense of belonging and rootedness that's especially important for vulnerable households. And in terms of design, I would say first the, the policy, first design comes in in a couple of ways. The design comes in in terms of policies and programs that we need to design these programs in a way uh, that is more inclusive in envisioning um, a more equitable future for our cities. But of course, there's more standard design like planning, architecture, landscape architecture, uh, and so on that's really important. So we need that visionary design. Uh, that's also really crucial to um, to a uh, just city and creating a just city. Now, does it mean that there's specific construction strategies that will make or break society? No, of course, that's too simple. That's environmental determinism. But designers, by nature, are visionary, and they need to be part of the conversation. So I will say to you what I ask of designers and like design students, right? to be leaders and to be thoughtful about your work. And I would ask you what, it's hard to see from down here. Uh, so I would ask you, what are the forces that drive your design? What, what are the forces that drive the pen that we have to remain cognizant of our values? And in the end, this is now no longer working. So I guess that means my time is on. Oh, I had such a cool picture at the end. <laughs> I think anyway. Oh, well, it's not that it's not that cool. So I think it's okay. It's okay. All right. So what I would say in the end is. At, in the end, design always, always as if you give a damn. Thank you.
for example, um, the historical neighborhood of Capitol Hill and the Central District, um, for historically communities of color, because that would be in the case of the legal uh, uh, And so these are some of the neighborhoods that we're seeing now, the impact of the education, um, but I think uh, that the, 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 the redevelopment of the housing stuff is to be denser housing stuff. And so my question is around this tension between uh, progress and development and actual preservation um, of, of places and spaces in which uh, people have lived here historically, not because they were poor, not because, um, not because of, you know, that it was like a great view or something. Um, although some cases, I guess, the threat is actually not really great views. Um, so Sure. I'm just wondering about the sign. I just want to make one point about 
ali no meio do processo de uma hora de transferência. Uma hora de transferência. Se você tem que ser da hora de transferência, você vai ser da hora de transferência. 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 Thank you. 
So the preference seems to be uh, in these standalone uh, single-family houses, three stories tall, uh, that only tech workers can afford. So can I just encourage you to keep track of when the city council is uh, considering changes to the design review process itself, because one of the recommendation So a question of eight friends um, here at our time. Uh, we have said thank you for your attention and taking our panels for your uh, insights. Uh, thank you for them for a round of applause. Yeah. 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 Yeah.